सर्वे भ्यो नम ए वॉम वेलकम टू एवरी वन टू दिस थर्ड डे एंड द कंक्लूडिंग पार्ट ऑफ द सेकेंड एडिशन ऑफ द लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन जदुनाथ सरकार टाइटल्ड जदुनाथ सरकार द एसेटिक मेजेस्टी ऑफ इंडियन हिस्ट्री वी हैव हैड द ग्रेट प्लेजर ऑफ लिसनिंग टू संदीप बालकृष्णास लेक्चर्स ऑन द सेम टॉपिक एंड द टाइटल इट सेल्फ इज वेरी डिस्क्रिप्टिव एंड सजेस्टिव at the same time because it is descriptive for obvious reasons and it is also suggestive because history must be approached in an ascetic manner so it also gives out that suggestion the kind of ascetic asceticism so to speak that jadunath sarkar uh, practiced in his personal life stands as an example for many people to at least try and emulate which is so conspicuous by its absence in the present time so starting from the very title we must be thankful to sandeep balakrishna for unveiling before us the grand personality and the profound contribution of jadunath sarkar's contribution to history in the first edition and this and these two days uh, he has really opened up before us a bag full of anecdotes about jadunath sarkar i really marvel at uh, sandeep balakrishna's patient toil in going through thousands and thousands of pages of records etc of books and so on about jadunath sarkar because i for one know that all this information is not available one easily and certainly not available in one place so i take this opportunity on behalf of all our listeners to thank sandeep balakrishna for this great uh, commitment that he has uh, exhibited in uh, go in giving this lecture the preparation itself uh needs to be uh, needs to be encouraged in my opinion yesterday and day before he spoke about jadunath sarkar's contribution as a member of legislature as the founding father or for setting up or initiating the idea uh, of what eventually became the national archives what was the forerunner of the national archives so these are things which are not unknown to our people but are uh, sometimes ignored sometimes obfuscated for various reasons so apart from jadunath sarkar's scholarship and his contribution to history historiography etc his contribution to allied disciplines he narrated an anecdote uh, which told us which uh, spoke to us about uh the incident which actually seeded the idea of a national archives or something of that sort in jadunath sarkar's mind so till that period in time we did not have a dedicated institutional mechanism in order to protect and uh, perpetuate our historical documents so the credit goes to Aja- acharya jadunath sarkar and he also uh, narrated va- various incidents and anecdotes that uh, uh, you know that draw home the fact that he did not miss even a single day as a member of the legislature he did not even miss a single session so not just his the values he exemplified as a scholar but even as a person even uh, the values he exhibited in personal life those are also those hold great lessons for us and uh, the seminar method of teaching that he inculcated i think that has great value even today it can be followed i'm sure it is followed in very parts as well so apart from the subject matter of dealing with jagadunath sarkar's body of work in terms of his books uh, the lectures he delivered and so on sandeep balakrishna has also uh, he has also narrated various allied disciplines uh, and uh, side lights so to speak so this has been a wholesome series of lectures and uh, i take this opportunity once again on behalf of the gokhale institute of public affairs and all of our listeners who have assembled here and also the listeners who are going to listen online i request him to please continue such lectures please accept our invitation and come here and enlighten us on various other topics which we need to know on this occasion i thank sandeep balakrishna request him to please accept a token of our respect and begin today's lecture thank you a very good evening <coughs> namaste and uh, a very warm welcome once again to the third and the 
concluding day of the second edition of this series on uh, Jadunath Sarkar or and his ascetic majesty of uh, Indian history. <clears throat> and uh, I once again uh, offer my heartfelt thanks to uh, Shashi Kiran and all of you here. He has made my task of recapitulating uh, yesterday's and today's session um, uh, in a very succinct way. So I think we can directly uh, jump to the beginning of uh, today's uh, topic. And I might take uh, five or six minutes uh, more uh, in this session. So <clears throat> yesterday we you know, had a chance to look at some of its uh, uh, various aspects of uh, Jadunath Sarkar's uh, uh, life as a scholar, his contributions to the IHRC and the extraordinarily ruthless manner, the shameful manner in which he was shunted out of the very institution he built, the IHRC, and we followed it up with some uh, delightful and even humorous anecdotes about his uh, method of working and uh, you know uh, other things, his library and so on, how he built it up. So with that, continuing on that thread, today we will uh, uh, to begin with, we will look at some major aspects of the Acharya's daily routine and the disciplined habits that he had cultivated over a lifetime, and they all remained with him uh, till he passed away. Now, it is clear just from his body of work, one thing becomes very clear that discipline, in fact, was the bedrock of all his staggering accomplishments. <clears throat> and fortunately for us, we have a massive treasure of eyewitness anecdotes from his students and, of course, uh, uh, G.S. Sardesai, who stands foremost uh, in that list. And every person who had the fortune of staying at his home <clears throat> makes uniform observations about Jadunath's ironclad habits, his uh, discipline, and his strict regimen. And topping this list of, uh, you know, what constitutes as overall as discipline, was Jadunath's punctuality. In fact, he had set very strict timings for his breakfast, bath, lunch, his afternoon siesta, tea, and dinner. <clears throat> Not only that, Jadunath had also allocated a specific timing even for opening his letterbox and searching them and you know compiling them, arranging them during uh, uh, each day. Uh, and unless he was traveling, Jadunath scrupulously adhered to this routine. Now, uh, let's begin with the first story. It happens in 1935, and Professor Hariram Gupta, he was staying in Jadunath's uh, house in Darjeeling for several weeks, doing research, taking its guidance, and you know so on. And thanks to Hariram Gupta, we get uh, uh, Acharya Jadunath Sarkar's timetable, quote, <coughs> I daily found him at work before 6 a.m. He would retire for lunch at 12. At 1.30 p.m., he was seen strolling in the spacious compound of his house. At 2 p.m., he was again at his desk. A bare cup of tea was served to him at 4.30 p.m. In his study room, when he might spare a couple of minutes for conversation with a visitor or a research worker, he would leave off working at 6 p.m. when he went out all alone, walking as if he were running. <clears throat> Having found no time to talk to him about my research project, I asked for his permission to accompany him in his evening walks. No, was the reply. As a rule, I prefer to be left alone during these walks. You may discuss your difficulties, if any, between 1.40 and 1.55 p.m. Close quote. <laughs> but <clears throat> for all his uh, strictness and punctuality and this, you know, uh, timely manner, Jadunath never imposed his timetable on other people. Quite the contrary, he respected other people's time with even greater care. And this also included people who were his students or who were juniors in his rank and position in his professional life. But once Jadunath gave his word, he would go out of his way to give his time in order to help sincere students and researchers. Now, we can look at only one example in the you know, 
ಲಿಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಸ್ಪೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಫ್ರಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಯಾಕೆ ಅಂತಂದರೆ ಈ ಆಚಾರ ಕುರಿತು ಇಂಥ ವಿಷಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಎಷ್ಟು ವಿಪುಲವಾದ ಎಷ್ಟು ಪುಷ್ಕಲವಾದ ಸಾಮಗ್ರಿ ಇದೆ ಅಂತಂದರೆ ಯಾವುದು ಹೇಳೋದು ಯಾವುದು ಬಿಡೋ ಅದು ಅಂತ ಯೋಚಿಸಿ ಕೊನೆಗೆ ಯಾವುದೋ ಒಂದು ಸೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಅದನ್ನು ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಇವಾಗಿಲ್ಲಿ ಸೊ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಹರಿರಾಮ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ವಿಸಿಟೆಡ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ಅಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲ್ಕಟಾ ಹೌಸ್ ಆಬ್ವಿಯಸ್ಲಿ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರಯರ್ ಅಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅ ಮಿನಿಟ್ ಲೇಟರ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಡೌನ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಟು ಮೀಟ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾರಿಯಿಂಗ್ ಎ ಬಂಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಇಸ್ ಆರ್ಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಹರಿರಾಮ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಅರ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ದೆನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ಅಟ್ ಎ ಟೇಬಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ಚೇರ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ರೂಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅಡ್ಜಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಕಿಚನ್ ದೆನ್ ಹಿ ವೆನ್ ಡೇರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪುಟ್ ದ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಇಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಕೋಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ಡೌನ್ ದ ರಿಸ್ ಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ರೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಯು ವಾಂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಟುಮಾರೋ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಲಿಪ್ ಅಲ್ಲದ ಅದರ ಟೇಬಲ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಒಂದು ಸ್ಲಿಪ್ ಇತ್ತು ಅದ್ರ ಮೇಲೆ ಬರ್ದಿಡು ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿಬಿಟ್ಟು ದೆನ್ ಹಿ ಸೆಡ್ ಡು ಯು ವಾಂಟ್ ಟೀ ಹರಿರಾಮ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಸೆಡ್ ನೋ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟೀ ಇಮಿಡಿಯೇಟ್ಲಿ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ವ್ಯಾನಿಶ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ರೂಮ್ ಅಪ್ ಸ್ಟೇರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹರಿರಾಮ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಇದು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ಕ್ಲೈಮ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಹರಿರಾಮ್ ಗುಪ್ತಾ ಗಿವ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ದ ಕ್ಲೈಮ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಕೋಟ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ಲಿ ಟೇಕನ್ ಹಾಫ್ ಅ ಮಿನಿಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಂತ ಇಷ್ಟು ದಪ್ಪ ಬುಕ್ ಬಿಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇದನ್ನು ನೋಡಬೇಕು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಸ್ಟಕ್ ಟು ದ ಸೇಮ್ ರೂತ್ಲೆಸ್ ಪಂಕ್ಚುಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೆಟಿಕ್ಯುಲೆಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಂಡೇವರ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ನೋ ಎಂಡೇವರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹಿಮ್ ವಾಸ್ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಆರ್ ಬಿಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ಲಿ ಥರೋ ಆಲ್ ದ ವೇ ಇನ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಹಿ ಡಿಡ್ ಹಿ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಕೆಪ್ಟ್ ಎ ರೆಗ್ಯುಲರ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಬುಕ್ ಫಾರ್ ಇಸ್ ಡೈಲಿ ಹೌಸ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಂಡಿಚರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಲಾಟೆಡ್ ಎ ಸೆಪರೇಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಫಾರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬುಕ್ ಕೀಪಿಂಗ್ ಹಿ ವುಡ್ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟ್ ರೈಲ್ವೆ ಮ್ಯಾಪ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಎ ಡೀಟೇಲ್ಡ್ ಐಟಿನರಿ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಪೋಸ್ ಜರ್ನಿ ಮಂತ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಡ್ವಾನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ವರ್ಕ್ ವಿತ್ ಹೆಮ್ ಇನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಕೆಪಾಸಿಟೀಸ್ ರಿಸೀವ್ಡ್ ಫುಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಹೌ ವೈ ವಾಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟಾಸ್ಕ್ ಬರೆದು ಕೊಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ಸು ಸೊ ಫರ್ಗೆಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಜೂನಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕೊಲೀಗ್ಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಅದರ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಇನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಕೆಪಾಸಿಟೀಸ್ ಈವನ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲೋಸೆಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ದೇಸಾಯ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಎ ವಿಕ್ಟಿಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಿಲಿಟರಿ ರೆಜಿಮೆಂಟ್ ಇದು ತುಂಬ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿದೆ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ಡ್ ದಟ್ ಸರ್ದೇಸಾಯ್ ವಾಸ್ ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ಇನ್ ಏಜ್ ಬೈ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಆರ್ ಏಟ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆ ಕಾಲದಲ್ಲಿ ವಯಸ್ಸಿಗೆ ಮರ್ಯಾದೆ ಇವೆಲ್ಲ ದೋಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಲೇಡ್ ಅ ಬಿಗ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಯು ನೋ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಕಸ್ಟಮ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ಸೊ ಒನ್ ಡೇ ಸರ್ದೇಸಾಯ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪೂನ ಆರ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಶೆಟ್ ಹಿ ರಿಸೀವ್ಡ್ ದ ಫಾಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ಅಲಾಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಪಾರ್ಸಲ್ ದಟ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಸೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಪಾರ್ಸಲ್ ಕಂಟೈನ್ಡ್ ದ ಫೈನೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಾರ್ಜಿಲಿಂಗ್ ಟೀ ಇವತ್ತಿಗೂ ಫೇಮಸ್ ಅದು ಸೊ ದಿ ಆ ಟೀ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಇದಿತ್ತು ಪಾರ್ಸ ಪಾರ್ಸಲ
ಈ ರೇಂಜಲ್ಲಿ ಇತ್ತು ಇವ್ರದ್ದು ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಶಿಪ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಕಾರ್ಪಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೆಟರ್ಸ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸರ್ದೇಸಾಯ್ ಇವೋಕ್ ಅ ವೈಡ್ ರೇಂಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಮೋಷನ್ಸ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ರೀಡ್ ದೆಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಹೈಲಿ ರೆಕಮೆಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಆಲ್ ರೀಡ್ ದೀಸ್ ಲೆಟರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫುಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಇವೋಕ್ಸ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಅಡ್ಮಿರೇಷನ್ ಥ್ರಿಲ್ ಡಿಲೈಟ್ ನಾಸ್ಟಾಲ್ ಜಿಯಾ ಬಟ್ ಅಬವ್ ಆಲ್ ಅ ಪ್ರೊಫೌಂಡ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಯರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಶಿಪ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಟ್ ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಲೈಫ್ and i really hate to say this but all kinds of poisonous and dangerous nonsense are prescribed as lessons in our school textbooks but <clears throat> i'll say with full confidence that even if a fraction of selections from these letters were prescribed as lessons our children would grow up with a sound education a well rounded education in the real sense of the term but beyond the strictness there was a softer side to jadunath's outward you know uh, strictness and here also i have the problem of plenty the abundance of episodes like i said yavud helodu yavud bidodu anta so i'll pick up one beautiful uh, anecdote <clears throat> in 1919 jadunath was transferred to the ravenshaw college in katak and it was there that kwanungo first became his direct disciple and this is what konungo writes and i quote jadunath picked up earnest workers to start researches in the history of orissa some of those who had been either his pupils or his casual students are today in the forefront of researchers and educationists in orissa this is how he built their career katak back then was a miserable town only third rate food stuff was available in the market Jadunath's household was a mess of hangers on and he himself had to pay and find everything for them. Yeah, yes, Jana lectures Martha Rivati Vella. Close quote. And that <coughs> was when Konungo closely watched his master at work and what he writes about uh, this great Acharya is extremely elevating. It is also highly moving. Quote. even in the midst of his engrossing literary preoccupations he was very strict and methodical in account keeping in a corner of his library there was lying in a heap of khatas the size of 1/8 of a full scrap sheet each containing a months of bazaar accounts in patna and banaras for about 2 decades 20 varsha the market lekka provision lekka bardittidro and he had preserved it what he denied himself in physical comforts he would liberally provide for others <clears throat> we have hardly known any other master laboring and spending so much of his time and money in training up novices in historical researches in historical research and giving them a start in life <clears throat> his method was his own ane nadide hadi he never believes in narrow specialization till the novice has read widely in and around his subject and acquired a general acquaintance with the standard works of master writers every afternoon he would inquire about my progress take me out with him in the morning evening walk and have my meals with him talking nothing but history sahanav bunaktu where are such masters today dud kotre phd kodtara so konungo also gives us a very very humorous uh, anecdote this happens in uh, uh, the same ravensha college in katak extremely humorous account and uh, uh, this is about jadunas jadunath sarkar's utmost hatred this is not my word but uh, konungo's word sarkar's utmost hatred for rats he says very clearly that the acharya had given specific orders to his staff and to his students to destroy every rat at sight nodi takshana adanna horadakbeku anta strict orders ittu quote <clears throat> he would call us as the beaters in the hunting of rats in his library <clears throat> we three juniors and his other students we were to drive the rats from the corners in the library towards the door where jadunath stood ready with a hockey stick and no rat escaped him alive close quote and uh, 
here is another anecdote it is uh, humorous and it's delightful and very inspirational also there is a lot of lessons in this so this is narrated by uh, a person named uh, m v kibe and he was a relative of g s sardesai his full name is madhav vinayak kibe he was also quite an esteemed scholar of history and he was living in indore once uh, sarkar and sardesai they landed in indore in search of some valuable historical records in kel sai torge and uh, these records they had located uh, you know uh, the place of these records they were lying with a local zamindar in indore and uh, both of them stayed in kibe's house and kibe says that they were my honored guests and this zamindar had been kibe's uh, classmate in school and uh, sarkar got talking to kibe with the he had a finely honed uh, skill and instinct of a investigative detective so he began asking casual questions uh, to kibe about the zamindar and his personality and what he learned was that this zamindar was an extremely orthodox person andre madi madi zamindar antarala a type manushya so the next day jadunath sarkar discarded his regular attire which was generally a coat and suit and tie and he dressed himself as an orthodox brahmana so kibe gives us a fine portrait of how jadunath looked in this disguise and i quote jadunath sarkar assumed the garb and appearance of an orthodox brahman by putting on sandalwood paste mixed with saffron on his forehead and both sarkar and sardesai dressed in turbans went with my hearty support to the zamindar close quote and sure enough the moment the zamindar saw them he was thoroughly impressed and respect and reverence just gushed forth towards what he thought were learned brahmana pandits but their quest for these documents remained fruitless because for all his orthodoxy for all his respect for panditya or pandits not panditya for all that this zamindar turned out to be the ultimate itihasa pishuna literally in the english i'll translate madre it means historic miser but this incident what innately what it shows is a kind of work and the sort of extent to which jadunath sarkar could go in the service of unearthing historical truths and uh, simplicity frugality self reliance and a self effacing attitude are four main traits at least that's what i have been able to discover in uh, jadunath sarkar's character the rest of the world merely saw jadunath sarkar which was the outer form of the of this great acharya and this outer form of jadunath was a person who was stately aloof majestic commanding blunt curt and therefore unapproachable but those who perceived him realized that these forbidding traits were not consciously cultivated but they were a natural fabric woven into his personality and we have an absolutely glorious picture of the acharya written by a bengali history scholar named nihar ranjan ray quote there is an image of acharya jadunath that people who knew him carry in their mind it is a image of a man erect it is a it is a image of a man of erect unbending personality strong as thunder but yet governed by rules and self control someone who was straight simple and measured in his speech who was puritanical in character and lived a life of strict routine someone indifferent to pleasure and unperturbed by suffering now nihar ranjan ends uh, this description by invoking the bhagavad gita and likening acharya jadunath sarkar with the sthita pragna described in this immortal work and we also get another ennobling uh, clue about these uh, character traits in a speech that jadunath sarkar himself delivered in the early 1950s uh, in that period 
a group of his admirers had organized a felicitation program in uh, Sarkar's honor in some town in Bengal. Uh, the details are unclear. And this is what Jadunath uh, said in his speech, and I quote, <clears throat> if we want to keep alive in our country the tradition of, the tradition of original research, our researchers will need to practice Chitta Shuddhi. Chitta Shuddhi meaning truth seeking. That is, the truth seeking disinterested person engaged in historical research will need to go beyond the confines of his time, country and society and hold in check the desire for cheap appreciation from the people. The thought that some university will give me a doctorate degree or that some literary society will recognize this book with a prize. Such desires cannot be the ideal of a true researcher. Such is the difficult vow that we have to take in our own hearts. Close quote. <clears throat> and in this and many other aspects, we spot several traits of character that all the masters the majority of the masters of the modern Indian Renaissance shared an aversion or indifference to fame, conviction in a great ideal and an infinite capacity to follow that ideal till the end, an innate loftiness and magnanimity of spirit, a certain sense of detachment, a courageous pursuit of truth, untiring work, a deep and affectionate bond with the ancient Indian ethos, and an enlightened and not emotional patriotism. So we see all these traits in Jadunath Sarkar, DVG, Acharya M. Hiriyanna, P. V. Kane, R. C. Majumdar and so on. And if you have the time, Gokhale Institute, uh, uh, I think earlier in this year, had organized a beautiful and enriching series titled uh, uh, Exemplars of Indian Renaissance. A YouTube It's very enriching. And in fact, this is what Jadunath Sarkar himself says about a true Indian Renaissance, and I quote, the mere copying of the externals of European civilization without undergoing a new birth of spirit cannot produce a true Renaissance. India was not called upon to plume herself in the borrowed feathers of European civilization. She had to assimilate modern thought and modern arts into her inner life without any loss of what she had long possessed and without totally discarding the past. Close quote. Idinne Kane or History of Dharma Shastra, last volume al Baritare, in when he sums up the entire work. Don't throw the baby out of the bath water. And as another example, we have the illustrious legacy of DVG who throughout his life wish to live as a vanasuma or a forest flower. And we also have this brilliant example of R.C. Majumdar, who boldly wrote the following lines in his classic work, History of the Freedom Movement in India, in three lines. And I quote, I have been a witness to the grim struggle from 1905 to 1947, and I do not pretend to be merely a dispassionate or disinterested spectator of these events. I would have been less than a human being if I were so. How many scholars today in any field have this kind of naked guts? Ironically, but unsurprisingly, it is these very traits of character that fetched fame to all these stalwarts. Uh, okay, let's get back to Jadunath Sarkar. And almost... Everyone who has written about the Acharya have described him with the familiar analogy of coconut, hard on the outside, tender and nourishing within. You have to be hard. First, we will look at uh, the evocative painting that Professor Hariram Gupta has drawn in prose. I quote, Another dominant trait of his character is simplicity. As a matter of fact, simplicity may be described as a keynote of his character. He is simple in his habit, simple in his language, almost incredibly simple in everything about him. For a man whom nothing has been denied in life, this simplicity is almost sublime. 
he can be as comfortable and contented in a poor man's hut as in the palatial guest houses of the old indian princes he does not smoke he does not drink he does not chew betel leaf he does not even crave for tea he has no costly habits except buying rare books and manuscripts and needs hardly anything else but two plain ordinary bengali meals a day he sits and studies on a wooden bed with a small pillow to support him he has no almiras for his books etc they are piled up on open uh, iron shelves going up to the ceiling for convenience a bamboo ladder is always in the room 60 varshalo hattta idru adanna jadunath's frugality is also notable in personal expenditure he hates waste either in his own home or in public office you will get back your visiting card after the interview <laughs> he uses a postcard if it can contain what he wants to say all his letters are written on plain small sized sheets his valuable notes and translations of rare manuscripts are written on short slips of paper which lie tied up in bundles in his library <clears throat> the water taps in his house cannot be kept open unnecessarily at meal at meal times a full glass of water cannot be placed before him because his need is only 2/3 of a tumbler his simplicity is at its best when we come to his modesty about himself he never writes for popular applause his aversion for publicity is instinctive and deep seated inclined to avoid society and to shun limelight jadunath carries himself with an unspeakably charming reserve and plainness close quote uh in <clears throat> some of these aspects <clears throat> i am reminded of two contemporary stalwarts they are living amidst us who closely resemble uh, acharya jadunath sarkar the first is um, naroja dr s r ramaswami and the second is shatavdani ganesh unfortunately is not there and uh, i speak from personal experience shashi can be my witness and collaborator both of them carry their eminence like cotton and they wear their fame lightly because i have seen similar paper slips and envelopes and postcards and wedding invitations and even bus tickets in dr ganesh's house and on ramaswami's uh, dr ramaswami's desk both of them have scribbled all sorts of invaluable insights and one liners and poetry and all sorts of notes notes on a vast variety of subjects and some of these i am fortunate to say this some of these have uh, acted as superb raw materials for my own writing and all these papers are so numerous that they can literally be weighed both literally and metaphorically takdi lag tu bodo ashtu bitidarana but their real value not weight their real value can only be measured using the gold standard and let's get back to jadunath sarkar and uh, we look at another beautiful anecdote given by sardesai and i quote jadunath has never hankered after money his own personal needs are few he can sleep on the floor and take rest wherever he needs it I have observed him working with a kerosene lamp during the long hours of the night and then soundly asleep in the late morning hours. He has often worked days and nights without rest and lives a life of puritan simplicity. He would never leave to others the work that he can do himself. When he is my guest at my home, he has always done his own washing himself and even clean the cup and saucer that he has used. to my objection to this he used to reply by quoting socrates <clears throat> he who has the fewest wants is most like the gods he never requires the services of a stenographer or a typist his own drafts written in hand are always better than printed matter accurate to the last comma close quote remember jadunath sarkar was a son of a zamindar himself is amindar akalad bengali cinema gal nivu nodidre 
ಒಂದು ಟಿಪಿಕಲ್ ಬೆಂಗಾಲಿ ಜಮೀನ್ದಾರಿ ಲೈಫ್ ಪಿಕ್ಚರ್ ಸಿಗುತ್ತೆ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಪ್ರಿಟಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ದ ಕಾಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಬೆಂಗಾಲ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಹೆಲ್ ಬೇಸಿಕಲಿ ಎನಿವೆ ದ ಆಚಾರ್ಯ ಸಿಂಪ್ಲಿಸಿಟಿ ಫ್ರೂಗ್ಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ರಿಲಯನ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸಿಪ್ಲಿನ್ ಆಲ್ ದೀಸ್ ವರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಲಿಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಮಿಯರ್ಲಿ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ ಅಲೋನ್ ಸಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಇನ್ ದ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟೀಸ್ ಅ ಬಂಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಟ್ ಪಾಟ್ನಾ ದೇ ಕೇಮ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೇನ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಡ್ ಫಂಡ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿ ಅಂದರೆ ಫಂಡ್ಸ್ ಅಲೋಕೇಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇದು ಬುಕ್ಸ್ಗೆ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ಗೆ ಅಂತ ಜದುನಾಥ್ ಸರ್ಕಾರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಇಮ್ಮಿಡಿಯೇಟ್ಲಿ ಫ್ಯೂರಿಯಸ್ ನಾಟ್ not for predictable reasons but for an entirely different reason and in a rare moment he narrated some brief anecdotes about his own uh, difficulties when he started life at the uh, patna university and uh, he said that when he joined the patna uh, college it its history department library history department it it did not even possess one set of the cambridge history of europe that was an indispensable inevitable prescribed work textbook uh, volumes for uh, uh, students of ma students of history that library didn't even university library didn't even have this and it was jadunath sarkar who single handedly built up that library to the state that the students who complain to him now found it in and then jadunath rounded off the lecture uh, to these students and told them that opportunity does not make a man but it is a man who creates opportunities for himself but more importantly creates opportunities for others in this context konungo writes a very very perceptive remark thumba chanagide idu and i quote from a distance one might think that jadunath is a child of opportunity born with a silver spoon in his mouth and he had the great khuda baksh oriental public library at his disposal we have yet to wait and see whether all the libraries in india would produce even an apology of jadunath kriyad siddh satve bhavatam bhavati mahatam nopakarane ide classic example and uh, we can close this uh, section with two two more beautiful anecdotes the first one shows uh, the acharya's uh, natural aversion to fame and publicity in 1954 professor hariram gupta and other scholars had planned to bring out a commemoration volume on acharya jadunath sarkar and this was to be financed by the punjab university <laughs> and the moment uh, hariram gupta mentioned the proposal to jadunath this is what the acharya said and i quote no such proposals have been made to me in the past and i have ignored all these i do not want it do not bother me on this nasty subject i do not want any publicity and i shun the very idea of money being raised for me close quote in other words Jadunath was against using taxpayer money for a volume celebrating him. Finally the volume came out uh, he was uh, persuaded by a bunch of scholars and they said that look the money funding for this uh, volume is going to come from a private source and not from the university that's when he agreed. And the second uh, anecdote reveals Jadunath Sarkar's deep affinity and affection for the cultural and literary heritage of uh, bharat varsha while his dedication to history was the most visible and practical aspect of displaying this love for a culture those who were close to him witnessed the other facets g s sardesai the closest of his close friends shows us this uh, uh, facet and i quote though jadunath has mastered several modern indian and foreign languages particularly french and portuguese none stands nearer to his heart than the treasures of sanskrit literature he withdraws himself from the fatigue of the mughal akbarat into the company of kalidasa and bhavabhuti giving loose rein to his mind and memory 
either to sail with a cloud messenger in Meghadutam all the way to Alaka or ramble with the disconsolate Sri Ramachandra moistening the banks of the mourning Malini and her forest girt grottos echoing with the sweet memories of his exile or occasionally to the waterfall of the Mahakoshi in the company of gods to solicit Parvati of her father as the bride of Shiva madly in love with her in Kumara Sambhavam. Close quote. This is the first time that they are talking about this. It's very interesting. And uh, Jadunath Sarkar's favorite poets were Kalidasa and Rabindranath Tagore. And poetry in its truest sense, in this sense, the kind of poetry that Kalidasa and others wrote, that was very dear to his heart. And he once told Sardesai, and I quote, the time of the wise men passes in wooing poetry. Close quote. And I will also make a, a conjecture at this point. Any historian or scholar or writer or any person who has touched the pinnacle in his or her field, any such person who has not enjoyed and savored and internalized true poetry will definitely produce dull and listless books. This is a fact of nature. And the best proof of uh, this fact is the abysmal quality of history books that are being churned out in recent years, both by academic scholars and popular authors. The prose is dull, there is no feeling, and it does not move beyond two sentences. And uh, in this context, I am uh, reminded of a Kannada book review that I read many years ago. I forget the name of the reviewer, but uh, one line has stayed in my mind. It's uh, brilliant. So, he Kriti yalli aala matra valla nire illa. Kyaar bar dheera matto ki dhe. So, another little known fact uh, uh, is that Jadunath Sarkar has lovingly and brilliantly translated uh, Rabindranath Tagore's poems and short stories and literary essays into English in uh, several issues of uh, the modern review. He kept up this translation endeavor for several years and I am tempted to offer a tiny slice that shows the Acharya's translation prowess from Bengali to English and his mastery over both the languages. Quote, if you plant everything in its proper place in nature, it loses its violence. But if you detach it thence and confine it within the narrow circle of men, it looks extremely hot and inflamed like a sick man's body. Witness the picture of the hermitage in Kadambari. There, the wind makes the plants and creepers bow their heads down in adoration. The trees are strewing their leaves as in a puja. The arena of the cottages is covered with a shamaka paddy spread out to dry. <clears throat> There the banana, amalaka, lavali, badari and other fruits are gathered together. The woodland resounds with a loud recitation of the brahmana kids learning their lessons. The garrulous green parrots are repeating the Vedic mantras they have learnt by frequent hearing. The jungle fowl are eating up the food offered at the worship of nature. From the lake nearby, the goslings have come to pick up the Nivara paddy dedicated at the puja. The doors are licking the bodies of the hermit boys with their tongues. Here too, the inner meaning is the same. The hermitage stands forth at the, as a place that has done away with man's aloofness from plants and creepers, beasts and birds. This old lesson has been taught in our sacred land over and over again. This is pure poetry disguised as prose. Barnabatta comes alive first in Tagore's Bengali and is losslessly transported in Jadunath Sarkar's mellow English. And uh, arguably one can challenge a native English speaker or writer to render Barnabatta with this quality. And now we can move on uh, to the next section. And as we have seen uh, uh, in both the first and second editions of this uh, lecture series, Jadunath Sarkar consciously avoided fame and publicity 
but his eminence brought fame to his doorstep and then it followed him like a shadow and along with it it obviously brought envy jealousy and pitiness like every luminary who towers over others like the gauri shankara peak jadunath sarkar's majesty and eminence elicited vicious gossip from lesser mortals who began to spread wild rumors about him their logic was very simple it was a horrible logic but it was very straight forward if you cannot ascend the gauri shankara you can at least try to burn it and melt it into water idu logic avaru uh, yesterday i narrated the depressing story of how jadunath was deliberately targeted and isolated and finally ousted from the ihrc the very institution he founded and built and nurtured uh, a similar incident occurred much earlier than this ihrc episode the british government in 1929 awarded him the knighthood which means he would be called sir and jadunath accepted it with his typical stoicism sthita pragnate and in fact the government house bearer and it was a formal title messenger anta he was called a house bearer so he came to jadunath sarkar's uh, uh, house and he handed him a big embossed envelope containing the citation text of the award and the acharya opened it glanced at it briefly folded it put it in his pocket and said nothing to anybody later at dinner his wife kadambini sarkar asked him a simple question and i quote i hear that you have become something is that true jadunath replied yes from today people will call you lady sarkar <laughs> so but not everybody celebrated his knighthood uh, several groups of his detractors began a smear campaign calling him a british stooge and slave but sarkar even at this remained detached sita pragnate illu maintain madadu while the sentiment behind the smear campaign is understandable these were all the, all these things came from alleged nationalists and freedom fighters the sentiment is understandable we can sympathize with that but it was patently misdirected so in this we have a parallel with uh, another uh, his uh, other contemporary eminence shri v s srinivasa shastri who was a dear friend of dvg as well uh, who was conferred with the title right honorable by the british government but in the climate of that era srinivasa shastri did far more service to the cause of vaidika brahmins and the larger hindu society than our traditional mathas dvg has written a superb profile i think it runs up to 100 pages in his gnapaka chitrashale he has written a extraordinary profile of shri shastri and he brings out the finer details of uh, his service to hindu society and the same analogy is applicable to jadunath sarkar in the realm of indian history misdirected nationalism and misplaced patriotism have had their share of eminent casualties these two are foremost among them and in fact jadunath sarkar himself severely criticized what he called false patriotism which does more harm than good as all of you are familiar with that maxim the road to hell is indeed paved with good intentions and in this context i must also mention jadunath sarkar's blunt but highly accurate assessment of mohandas gandhi and the congress brand of freedom fighters and i will read out just two gems from him the first is jadunath's assessment of the consequences of gandhi's brand of mass freedom struggle quote our educated and well to do countrymen consider it a fine sport to encourage reckless and malicious attacks on public servants and the sources of public revenue under the holy name of gandhi none of them had the sense or the courage to denounce it i am sick of the 
of this cat and mouse game which the blind congress is trying to play with pax britannica under the whip of a demented gujarati baniya son who believes himself to be an avatar is in a literal bardidare and it needs a slight explanation jadunath wrote this in a private letter to j sardesai and even in the luxury of that privacy he had used this kind of strong language to denounce gandhi and it was also completely uncharacteristic of the acharya who was generally reserved dignified uh, mellow and tempered in his language and conduct so we need to understand the exact reason that had infuriated him so much about gandhi <coughs> and that answer is not difficult to locate until gandhi's time political battles were fought in an atmosphere of dignified debates and respectful debates and disagreements and these happened in an atmosphere of mutual goodwill and respect and these were all done by you know truly eminent people who were not only learned in the scholarly or bookish sense but they had uh, their eye on the pulse of not only contemporary events but they had solid history to back them back their arguments and dvg beautifully describes this atmosphere in his uh, vritta patrike uh, it's a classic essay actually but uh, what he says is that until gandhi came these people like surendranath banerji uh, firosha mehta gopal krishna gokhale these people used to sit around you know in a atmos in a very learned atmosphere and they used to come thoroughly prepared they spoke on the basis of facts and there was no you know heated arguments and this slogan hearing and he see he writes that the moment gandhi came on the scene and you know became popular after lokmanya tilak's death this atmo he single handedly changed this atmosphere i can't get into the details but uh, all i can say here is that when gandhi burst on the scene he brought a new alleged weapon of freedom struggle it was called and all of you know it it was called satyagraha it's actually a weird compound word the satya in satyagraha this word is notable while its textual meaning sounds noble and pure and all those nice things its practice in public life was the exact opposite and for the first time in the recent history of that period mohandas gandhi had introduced the inheritors of a profound spiritual civilization to a crude street level politics of mindless and senseless agitation in short gandhi's new brand of politics disturbed education disrupted the unhurried rhythms of routine life and you know routine life these unhurried rhythms of routine life it is a great marker of a stable society a stable and a peaceful society and gandhi's brand of satyagraha actually taught lawlessness to our people and cultured savants and you know eminences like jadunath sarkar were horrified at the ob uh, obvious consequences of this kind of freedom struggle he and other luminaries of that period they had a different vision for india they wanted to uplift india through all encompassing education and discipline in the real sense of the term teaching civic sense basically and jadunath's view and vision of indian politics after we achieved independence it was rather simple it was straight forward indian politics had to be an expression of india's civilizational ethos and the unique gifts that only we have given historically to the world grammar is one upanishads darshanas all these are others anyway clearly if his vision of our education was pursued with sincerity and in a purpose driven fashion it would have created a good number of disciplined citizens who would become our political leaders and the verdict of history has actually vindicated acharya jadunath sarkar's gandhi's brand of freedom struggle completely undid this process of creating disciplined citizens all over the classic example is a kind of 
you know, traffic rule violations that happens. And we don't even care. Anyway, <clears throat> and the second gem from Jadunath Sarkar's pen is an even more blunt comment on the methods of various public organizations of that era. It's quite uh, horrifying to read this. And he's used very, very subtle language here. Quote, there is a notorious shameness in the agenda papers and procedures of the orthodox Hindu caste conferences and say an all India Muslim education conference. Both have stolen their programs from the hated Europeans. Our nationalists denounce the West with the very arguments and methods borrowed from the West. The Muslim League has stolen its thunder from the Indian nationalists, from the Indian National Congress, who had stolen it from the Irish. Close quote. And uh, your foresight and his vision is commendable, actually, because Jadunath wrote both these uh, uh, things in uh, 1928, roughly around that year, and in 1980. That is, after six years later, six decades later, Sri Dharampal, one of the greatest uh, uh, decolonizers of uh, modern India, Dharampal echoed the same sentiment in an interview with none other than Dr. S. R. Ramaswamy when he said, uh, when he said that the 1857 War of Independence was the last mass movement or revolt that was entirely homegrown. Every movement or every revolt, revolt or every reform that came after that period was either inspired by or directly copied from Europe. The biggest organization that copied this was the Indian National Congress. That's why you got an English-speaking Prime Minister as a first Prime Minister. Other mula illida. But to give only a fractional glimpse into where Jadunath Sarkar's heart really resided, I'll read out just two lovely lines from Konungo. Quote, Jadunath's religious charity generally goes to the Ramakrishna mission. The old knight, stiff in his literary hauteur and seemingly devoid of any sentiment, falls into raptures when he speaks of Sister Nivedita and warms up in genuine admiration at the mention of Swami Vivekananda. Close quote. And now we come to another great, uh, or rather a def a definitive element in uh, the Acharya's life. And this was his lasting friendship with Govind Sakaram Sardesai. Uh, in the first edition, I've narrated, you know, the circumstances under which they were introduced to each other. And I've also given some sidelights uh, uh, in both uh, uh, the two editions. But this needs a far more detailed uh, treatment in uh, uh, you know, this edition, because highlights don't, cannot do justice to uh, you know, flesh out this beautiful bond of friendship that existed between uh, these two stalwarts of Indian history. And the volume of material about their friendship is really substantial. And I feel it is my sacred duty to add some more illuminative details in this edition of the lecture series. And fortunately for us, a huge record testifying to their friendship has been preserved with minute and specific details. This You can find this in a volume titled Life and Letters of uh, Jadunath Sarkar. And it was a friendship spanning half a century. It was preserved in the form of correspondence for the same duration. I'll just uh, read out, you know, give you contours and specific details of how this panned out. Between the two of them, they wrote hundreds of letters to each other and of these, only 625 letters from Jadunath Sarkar to Sardesai and 700 letters from Sardesai to Sarkar have survived today. In fact, these letters precisely seeded the idea for writing an independent book in the mind of Deepesh Chakrabarti. Like, uh, like I said, he is the author of the book uh, titled The Calling of History, Sir Jadunath Sarkar and His Empire of Truth. Tumba appropriate title. 
and professor hariram gupta describes these letters in language in prose dipped, uh, dipped in great affection and reverence and i quote these letters document a constant intellectual pilgrimage of the two greatest historians of the mughals and the marathas in the history of india this is the first time that two great historians in the same field collaborated so intensely and so well <clears throat> the letters speak for themselves as a living day to day record of the impact of the two personalities upon each other and upon the development of study and research in the local history of various states especially during the mughal maratha period these letters show something of their inner life the homely little touches give occasional glimpses of the real sarkar and sardesai sarkar is deeply religious in the modern sense of the word for example avro tande parampada seradaga just to kind of seek solace he translated uh, 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 the bengali version of chaitanya mahaprabhu's uh, 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 works hymns into english taman tau samadana padaskodakke it is titled uh, the life and teachings of chaitanya illi did avaru his religious uh, deeply religious andre ee arthadal religious avaru he has a lofty ethical out- uh, outlook and is far more impressive more true and more elevated as compared with the steel frame of jadunath sardesai is more human he weeps and cries at the death of his only living child a young lad studying in germany and he speaks of him frequently in his letters to sarkar <clears throat> consider the duration continuity and range of his correspondence with enormous learning and a light touch expressing firm convictions and containing the exploits of two self-reliant scholars in the field of historical research think of the situation of the two men who stuck up this deep and lasting friendship it's much and what follows is extraordinary one is a bengali and the other a maharashtrian having different tradition uh, traditions speaking different mother tongues one belonging to the most unorthodox of the hindu castes uh, jadunath sarkar was a kaista and the other to a staunch brahmin family one is a habitual meat eater and the other a strict vegetarian one is tall dark stern and rigid the other short fair soft and charming and the distance of 1300 miles separating the two however they had too much of respect for each other to desire uniformity of opinion close quote this is also how a person should write about a subject or topic or a person that he is deeply passionate about professor hariram gupta has accomplished really a fine feat of textual affection but all said and done hariram gupta is essentially an outsider so let us hear of what acharya jadunath sarkar himself says about his friendship with sardesai quote our comradeship in letters developed into a sort of sentimental family relationship overriding the distance of geography of race and caste i have lived with him at patna calcutta and darjeeling and he with our family at bombay and other places we have enjoyed our happiest times together in my last shelter of old age on the bank of the indrayani river at kamshet working hard to reconstruct the history of the peshwa regime close quote idu nijavakku ondu gurukula ond hermitage ashrama tara iddid avaru kamshet mane indrayani river you can only transport yourself back to that era and imagine those uh, serene surroundings anyway and this is how sardesai repay sarkar's affection quote i was able to carry to completion the stupendous work of editing the series of 45 volumes of the peshwa daftar selections mainly through the active and unstinted support both moral and intellectual which i received from jadunath 
during four years of abnormal trouble and stress that bore me down. It was his loving encouragement and pressure that could persuade me to join him in our next venture, namely the publication of the Cognate series of 14 volumes of the Pune Residency Correspondence. Close quote. Now, interestingly, uh, Sardesai wanted to publish the full correspondence between them and he asked uh, Sarkar's opinion uh, and permission and Sarkar wrote his reply in a letter dated 10th May 1943 and I quote, go through it slowly and exhaustively because the free unrestricted int intimacy of private correspondence must avoid the public gaze. Close quote. And unfortunately, time constraints don't allow me to elaborate further on the, their letter exchanges. Uh, plus, the letters by themselves are quite self-explanatory. And so I'll just read out some extracts from a few letters that uh, Sarkar wrote to Sardesai first. And then I'll read out the letters that Sardesai wrote to Jadunath Sarkar. And uh, I've selected them, uh, you know, just to give you a flavor of the letters of the kind of topics that uh, these two stalwarts uh, constantly discussed. The first letter that is available to us that Jadunath Sarkar wrote to G.S. Sardesai is dated 18th June 1907. Quote, the only histories that we have of the period from 1757 to 1857 are in English, Persian and Marathi. The Persian histories were mostly written by flattering Muslims for their English patrons and hence they do not give the other side. I subjoin a list of works under each of these heads with comments, close quote. And Jadunath gives a list of 20 works in a letter to a friend. And in another long letter dated uh, 4th of February 1908, we get this unknown nugget from Aurangzeb's history and I quote, <coughs> the war waged by John Child on Aurangzeb is silently passed over by all these Persian historians. So also are Shaista Khan's efforts to curb them. These matters were hardly talked about at Delhi. Only the briefest and scantiest reference to the Europeans is found in the many hundred letters of Aurangzeb which I have collected. Close quote. John Child was uh, an officer uh, in the East India Company. Aurangzeb at the height of his power. Ashtamarada, Ishtamarada and Bala glorify Martarala, Romila Thapar and company. He was actually fighting a losing battle on multiple fronts. Especially in Bengal, all his officers and governors and revenue uh, bureaucrats were completely corrupt and they were given a solid drubbing by a relatively powerless uh, East India Company um, officer called John Child. Cleverly, all these Persian uh, chroniclers of uh, Aurangzeb times omitted this incident. Each time the Muslims have lost a battle throughout their history in India, their historians have completely downplayed the uh, battle or they have omitted the battle itself. Anyway, back to the topic. And we have another date, letter dated 15 July 1914. Uh, and uh, we get this beautiful tidbit and I quote, <laughs> I am glad to learn that Mr. Moji has mortgaged his museum to the Baroda state. Does it include his collection of Persian farmans issued to Shivaji's family and the Persian manuscripts containing certain Mughal Maratha letters which he refused to let me copy when we both visited him? This Maji fellow was another guy like that uh, Indore Darbar. The best way to utilize Maji's museum is to issue a, a descriptive catalog of it with plenty of illustrations that would attract scholars to it and the collection would thus be made to yield fruit in the form of research." Close quote. So it is clear even in this short letter 
that in every waking moment of his life the acharya's devotion to history exemplified what can only be called a, a nirnidra concentration and focus id sadharanada avarga agalla idella unfortunately i have to stop at just this and read out two of sardesai's uh, letters to the acharya and both of them are quite revealing <clears throat> The first letter is dated 2nd February 1927 and I quote Rajwade passed away on 31st last month at Dhulia Rajwade is uh, VK Rajwade another great uh, collector of old historical documents and daftars uh, I have uh, mentioned about him in the first edition of this lecture series uh, the historical scholarship of Maharashtra is distinctly poorer by his death the year has been an abnormal one even for history khare parasnis bhave rajwade all having passed away in a short time close quote and here is another extremely interesting letter dated uh, 21st february 1927 and i quote and i must say one thing uh, in this connection sometimes both of them uh, wrote multiple letters uh, on the same day and posted them at different times of the day ayyo martoyitu aa hale letter la bariyad martoyitu anta innu one letter bar adhe dina post martta idu anyway i'll read out this uh, uh, letter maharashtra particularly the vociferous section of it is furious against you they are furious against me also for either siding with you in my views or not trying to stop your pen i don't know why these people cannot credit us with ordinary honesty <laughs> i am sure you and i differ in very many points but that is no reason why we should quarrel and imitate the pune tastes <laughs> obviously they cannot tolerate our being friends the pune section entirely forgets how much the history of shivaji owes to your labors you have made shivaji a human figure in the world all the episodes from afzal khan onwards are entirely your creation whatever maharashtra may say until i read this even i didn't know that jadunath was the first person to put afzal khan episode in the proper perspective and uh, it's incredible how the world takes great things for granted and how easily and how soon it forgets all these extraordinary things today it is common to see all kinds of hindu champions and uh, hindu saviors speak authoritatively about the decisive encounter of shivaji and afzal khan but how many of them knew uh, know that but for acharya jadunath sarkar's painstaking discovery and almost single handed reconstruction delivered in his masterly prose in such a lucid fashion the history field of maharashtra particularly and the mogal history on the larger canvas that field would still be grappling in the dark literally jadunath has put his nose and his dirty his hands in dust and dirt i don't mean to say all this in a demeaning or arrogant fashion but just to illustrate once again dvg's famous uh, verse lekka virisilla jagatannadi bandugala mankutimma ashte and this letter from sardesai to uh, sarkar and hundreds of similar letters are the primary sources that reveal to us the hatred that the pune school had against jadunath sarkar and why it ultimately threw him out of the ihrc and now we will look at uh, some very 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 delightful uh, incidents funny humorous uh, anecdotes uh, regarding uh, acharya jadunath sarkar's family life like his father jadunath sarkar also had a large and full family which uh, we used to call as tumbu kutumba and like his father jadunath also took his householders duties very seriously and this was similar to his dedication to history 
he has been compared to a great greek patriarch by his students and his admirers the acharya's wife i mentioned the name already kadambini sarkars she gifted him two sons named abani and satyendranath and three daughters respectively sudha priyamvada and rama jatunath also enjoyed the company of their children that is his grandchildren in all he had i think about uh, 16 grandchildren or more I, i have not calculated the exact number but this should be fairly accurate <coughs> jatunath was a deeply caring father but he was also a traditional hindu father he rarely displayed his love and affection openly both to his wife and children but his letters to sardesai revealing uh, reveal this filial love in a highly ende- endearing and moving fashion as konungo observes and i quote even his children could not approach him freely this was this can be compared to that uh, um, who's that uh, um, bharavi's father who was so strict that bharavi once uh, planned to assassinate his own father anyway and then he realized you know the kind of affection that uh, his father had and repented for it but anyway that's a different story this basically this is a tradition of how fathers used to conduct themselves anyway and from a very young age <clears throat> jadunath instilled in his children the same values that he practiced for example his youngest daughter rama she was what 10 11 12 years old and she would often bring breakfast or tea or biscuits to the research scholars who were residing in the acharya's gurukula he had a army of servants but still jadunath said that you know you have to told his daughter you have to personally give this so that by itself it teaches a lot of life lessons and uh, his wife kadambini was in every sense a devoted hindu wife sa pativrata as they used to be called and she was completely devoted to him till the very end she was a silent but the solid bedrock of support that was at the base of jadunath sarkar's scholarly superstructure all the students who stayed in his home have lavished enormous praise on her she was their mother away from their home she pampered them she fussed over them uh, and i will read out just a couple of anecdotes that bring out her true nature uh, and her affection in a very very evocative fashion the first is again by our old friend k r konungo he speaks of the time when jadunath sarkar was in ravenshaw college katak remember i have already spoken about the rotten condition of that city including the horrible food grains that were available third grade food step uh, food stuffs in yeah in this man's words this is the part 2 of that story quote to make matters worse jadunath had not taken his family with him to katak except his youngest son satyen babu who was in his early teenage so jadunath's household was a sort of mess of hangers on with himself having to pay and find everything for them a years experience of hardship when he had to bring rice and dal and salt from calcutta for all of us he must have realized what he really owed to our mother as an aid to research by keeping him physically fit and relieving him of petty vexations in maintaining a house much anagide idu and in another delightful remark konungo shows the other side of kadambini sarkar and the real power that she had and he says and i quote that the acharya's strict military rule applied only outside the home department of our mother nim galate nidru mane aache itkolli anta basically the acharya's other distinguished people dr p c roy choudhury he gives us a really poignant picture of uh, shrimati kadambini sarkar and i quote <coughs> the kitchen which lady sarkar ran did not make any distinction between her own children and the students or the research scholars who lived in that house that lady from within the house was a mother to the scholars living in dr sarkar's house close quote 
and we've already seen Kadambini Sarkar's uh, reaction to Jadunath's uh, when he received the knighthood. She simply said, oh, I heard you've become something. But all these Antevasins uh, in his house demanded a party to celebrate the occasion and Konungo writes this and I quote, there was no jubilation openly in the household nor any beating of drums from outside but only a heavy feast after three days which we extracted from the mother on this occasion. That, that bond of Salige, uh, it can come only from affection. But it appears that even the gods were jealous of Acharya Jadunath Sarkar's large, prosperous, happy and thriving family. And they, these gods, began to rain ruthless blows on him in quick succession. What makes it even worse is the fact that the blows came in the Acharya's old age. First, Jadunath Sarkar's mother died in 1939. She was very old, 94, that, that age bracket. By 1941 and 19, or 1942, Kadambini Sarkar had become an invalid. She had become bedridden. And then, between 1942 and 1957, Acharya Jadunath Sarkar had to cope with six deaths in his immediate family. On 13 February 1942, Jadunath Sarkar's second son-in-law, his name was Major Sudhir Ghosh, he was an army major, he had died on battlefield in Singapore in the Second World War. But the news of his death, this is actually very bad, but the news of his death reached Jadunath Sarkar only on October 11, 1946, almost five years later. And his letter, he writes a letter to Sardesai, it's very painful to read, and I quote, My anxiety about my son-in-law is growing more agonizing and has prevented me from doing my work. Close quote. Nala Korsha, no news. He thought that, you know, still held out the hope that he would be found, that he would be alive. And in 1946, the same year that, you know, he got this news, Jadunath Sarkar's eldest son, Abani Sarkar, was stabbed to death in Calcutta by the Muslim mob unleashed by Muhammad Ali Jinnah and his lieutenant Sukhra Vardi as part of their bigoted direct action day. And in a space of just four months, the Acharya had lost one son and one son-in-law. And three years later, that is in 1949, his youngest daughter Rama, remember 12-year-old girl, she had served daily breakfast to, to a student of Sarkar. His name is Professor A.L. Srivastava and he's the author of a brilliant book called The Delhi Sultanate. She was serving breakfast every day to this professor, to Jadunath's Antevasin in Darjeeling. She had died in England. She had already, by that time, she had already carved a good name for herself as a, prom a promising, brilliant scientist before death cut her short. And two years later, in 1951, Jadunath Sarkar's younger brother died. And in 1955, the Acharya's remaining son, Satyendranath Sarkar, died after prolonged suffering. He wrote a letter to Sardesai and it contained just one sentence. Quote, Last Thursday night, Satyen's sufferings came to an end and I now stand entirely sunless like you. Close quote. But the gods were still not yet done with this doyen of Indian history. In 1957, Jadunath Sarkar's eldest grandson, his name was Captain Amit Kumar, he also died. Clearly, a lesser mortal would have either gone insane or he would have committed suicide. But the Acharya obviously was made of steel. Although he went into occasional bouts of de uh, depression and he sought solitude, he lifted himself up by the sheer dint of superhuman resolve. 
he personified a, a timeless maxim duty transcends depression and his letter to sardesa is the first hand evidence of this it is dated 4th july 1947 just two weeks before india uh, one and a half months before india got independence he wrote the letter from calcutta and it is perhaps the only letter where he completely pours his heart out quote what robs me of my peace of mind is not grief for loss but the worry of having to manage the affairs of those people who should in the normal course of nature have looked after me in my old age but they have gone away so early and left on my my shoulders the burden of settling their property troubles educating their sons and marrying their orphan daughters two without daughters and one without daughter in law are now sheltered in my house and unless i can enjoy 10 years of more life 10 years more of life and health how can i set on their feet abani's sons are now aged 16 and 14 sudha's sons are aged 15 and 13 and 11 or provide husbands for priyam vadas seven daughters all of whom have been orphaned when maidens yel jana mommaklu hinmaklu lady sarkar has been living a tortured existence owing to her daily increasing rheumatic pain and swelling of her knees no medicine can cure her but the most notable line in this letter is this he says unless i can enjoy 10 years more of life and health and in hindsight it appears that jadunath sarkar actually willed himself to live for 10 more years you see like i said this letter is dated 1947 and jadunath sarkar passed away in 1958 11 years but you know what he writes after this melancholic letter let me read it out i have today started revising my english work of shivaji for the fourth edition in a few days i shall return you the remaining chapters for volume 3 as revised by me inna hogutte innonda books list ella kodtare bibliography but the letter still doesn't end there like i said uh, uh, he goes on to give various research papers and articles that he had recently read as recently as a week before he wrote the letter <laughs> and uh, he also asks uh, sardesai to send him updated research from his side and uh, before concluding this melancholic portion of jadunath sarkar's life i must mention another illuminating anecdote that shows his boundless profundity in the previous edition of this lecture series i mentioned how william erwin's daughter had entrusted the entire manuscript posthumous manuscript of his unfinished work which was later titled Mug later mughals uh, and jadunath sarkar revised it and published it and uh, how he transformed it into an authoritative volume today we will look at the epilogue to that story after these volumes were published in two volumes jadunath sarkar ensured that william erwin's children received a share of the book's royalties not only that he personally remitted those royalties to them they were not in india none of them were in india and he rem remitted the money to them unfailingly and even when he was reeling under depression from the serial debts in his of his family members he did not forget to deposit the royalties and all throughout all these years he had kept track of the exact addresses of erwin's children remember these manuscripts he got them from erwin's daughter sometime in the 19 18 or 19 1919 around that period basically and he had kept a track of them you know in whatever countries they were living with postal address updated postal address so he personally went to the post office and sent them the money and as a great proof 
we have a letter from william arwine's daughter in law not daughter so say her name is elonia and she wrote this letter to jadunath sarkar from cuba and i paraphrase uh, her letter i deeply thank you for the 50 pounds that you have mailed me please accept my liveliest gratitude and i pray to god for you this letter is dated 16 july 1956 two years before jadunath passed away and jadunath at that he was 85 years old in 1956 and he had walked to the post office to send her her royalty check and uh, this also this kind of you know extraordinary ethical sense reminds us of the final scene of dr sl bhairappa's classic vamshavriksha where you know uh, the central character shrinivas uh, shrotri he profoundly displays his sense of uh, dana and dharma when he gives away everything that he has and uh, i'll also mention another interesting nugget in uh, uh, passing when uh, jadunath sarkar was 70 years old his lungs could no longer tolerate the altitude of uh, darjeeling and so he decided to sell his uh, bungalow uh, in that place in 1954 jadunath sarkar sold his large bungalow to none other than tinsing norke the first man as you all know to scale the peak of mount everest so he had actually bought a gurukula and the first picture is once again provided by his devoted pupil our old friend konungo quote this is how he describes uh, jadunath sarkar uh, when he was 85 or 86 he lives today as the greatest historian of india beyond comparison jadunath at the age of 87 has a desolate home but his face beams when he tells his grandchildren I have another and an older family that is a family of my pupils and their pupils this large family is the only solace of his years of lonesome life close quote and the second is by another distinguished uh, disciple we already heard his name pc roy choudhury quote to recall sir jadunath the picture of a greek patriarch flashes in my mind life has treated him in a very cruel manner so far as domestic happiness is concerned he has lost some of his brilliant sons and one of them was associ- uh, assassinated in the communal troubles in 1946 his youngest daughter who was a brilliant science scholar was claimed by death while doing research in england god chose to make some of his daughters early widows but these misfortunes which would have made an average man forlorn frustrated and probably finished but they touched jadunath lightly so far as the outer world is concerned here is a man who stands aloft like a peak of a mountain and the world outside cannot possibly know what mishaps what these mishaps meant to him sir jadunath the man is a bigger source of inspiration than sir jadunath the historian but few have but few have had the opportunity to know him as such close quote acharya jadunath sarkar passed into the arms of eternity on 19th may 1958 aged 87 his last book was the slim but the power packed work titled the military history of india it is available online but his last piece of writing was not this book but it was a letter to his dear friend and his lifelong intellectual companion govin sakharam sardesai the acharya wrote this letter exactly 5 days before he shed his mortal bonds at the end of this letter he quoted these lines from a poem from alfred tennyson quote since we deserve the name of friends and thine effect so lives in me a part of mine may live in thee 
and move thee on to nobler ends. Close quote. Indeed, the Acharya's letter to Sardesai was timely. You know why? And it again shows his profound facet of his innate character. It was timely because Sardesai's birthday, 94th birthday, was on 17th May 1958. And Jadunath passed away on 19th May 1958. And this immensely talented and luminous younger friend had broken the queue. And Sardesai passed away the very next year in his house come hermitage at Kamshet on 29th November 1959. And perhaps they still continue their intellectual and scholarly collaboration in a world which we will never know or see. And, uh, but the tragedy did not end there in Sarkar's life. It continued even after the Acharya left this world and in hindsight, Jadunath was fortunate not to witness the violation and the defacing of Indian history at the hands of determined vandals as we shall see. In Calcutta, Jadunath Sarkar had built a spacious house in 1939 in an area named Lansdowne Road Extension. By 1954, that address was changed to number 10, Lake Terrace, Calcutta 29. That sacred place of pilgrimage is still standing on that location. So if you go to Calcutta, you can visit this place. In 1973, exactly 15 years after Jadunath left this world, the central government bought it and made it a part of the Indian Council for Social Science Research or ICSSR and something called a Center for the Study of Social Sciences is located in Jadunath Sarkar's old house. And uh, it was renamed as Jadunath Bhavan Museum and Resource Center, that is still its name. But beyond the naming of his house, a far more insidious and a far-reaching change had occurred. On the surface, the government had merely bought, purchased Jadunath's home. But in reality, it was a hostile Marxist takeover which was initiated by a communist monster. He has a name, Nurul Hassan. He was Indira Gandhi's Minister for State for Education. And Nurul Hassan was a direct disciple of another communist monster. His name is R.P. Tripathi. And he was one of the earliest detractors of Jadunath Sarkar. Both were, uh, R.P. Tripathi were, was uh, Jadunath's junior contemporary. And as long as this giant called Jadunath was alive, the Marxists really didn't dare to challenge him directly. And so they did what they do best. They bulldozed his grave to vaporize even the hint of memory, and speaking only metaphorically, Deepesh Chakraborty narrates the atmosphere in this so-called Center for Study of Social Sciences, which was located in Jadunath's old house. It was a center set up after usurping Acharya Jadunath Sarkar's Gurukula. Quote, Even though we inhabited this house, Jadunath Sarkar was but a faint whiff of the memory in the Marxist air that I breathed at the center. Sarkar had little or no afterlife in our conversations. This is a polite way of saying that these Marxists had erased his memory right in his house. But Nurul Hassan and his wretched gang did something even worse. They physically removed all the objects in Jadunath Sarkar's home. Furniture, decorations and you know other things. The vast treasure of his books and original papers were given away to the National Library. And this was the ultimate act of vandalism. And it is entirely consistent with the Muslim vandalism of Hindu structures like temples, universities, libraries, mathas and so on. And this is a partial story of how this peerless titan's stainless legacy was heartlessly erased from our national memory by third-raters like Nurul Hassan, 
Romila Tapar, Irfan Habib, Satish Chandra and that whole gang of uh, historical uh, vandals, basically the wretched mafia, Marxist mafia club who, who were disguised as history scholars. And uh, Dr. S.L. Bhairappa, he pays a glorious but indirect tribute to Acharya Jadunath Sarkar in the electrifying climax of Avarna, where Razia Elias Lakshmi blasts all these Marxist nation wreckers. He extends the tribute by copiously citing Jadunath Sarkar's works in the bibliography at the end of the novel. And as I narrated in the first edition of this lecture series, Jadunath Sarkar was not merely a scholar of history, he was also a sage and a seer in the real sense. He had his finger on the pulse of the changing currents of his time and he perhaps anticipated that his legacy would be sullied by such third raters. But we'll, know, we'll never know the truth. But what we have is a direct hint uh, from a very re revealing anecdote. <coughs> a person named Dr. Bidhan Roy Chandra, Dr. Bidhan Chandra Roy was Jadunath Sarkar's old student. He later became the chief minister of Bengal from 1948 till 1962. Once Bidan asked uh, a straightforward question to Jadunath Sarkar, please let me know what is the best way to remove all the statues and other artifacts of the colonial British rulers in the public spaces of Calcutta. Jadunath Sarkar wrote back to the chief minister, it was a simple line and I quote, my dear Bidan, you can remove the statues, but can you remove the pages from the history of India? Close quote. And this is exactly what has happened with the Marxist mafia. They erased all the physical objects that reminded people of Jadunath Sarkar and they have ultimately failed. This lecture series is one of the best proof of this leftist failure. And indeed, time has its own infallible method of taking revenge. And over the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a massive surge of interest in reviving the great and ennobling legacy of Acharya Jadunath Sarkar. At least two well-researched books about uh, uh, Jadunath have been published. The first is obviously Deepesh Chakrabarti's uh, uh, um, The Calling of History and another by T.C.A. Raghavan's History Men. This has happened because of the chokehold of the Marxists has been finally shattered, perhaps forever. It is one thing to agree with the Acharya, but an entirely different thing to casually dismiss his entire body of extraordinary historical work by simply branding him as a communal historian. Whatever that means, I mean, what do you mean communal historian? There is only historian, there is only a scientist, there is only a geographer. There is nothing like a communal scientist. So, this happy revival of Jadunath Sarkar's legacy is another proof that nothing which is intrinsically truthful and truly ennobling can be permanently destroyed. On the other hand, Romila Tapar and her Marxist gang have been thoroughly discredited and disgraced in their own lifetime and are today, they are regarded as academic criminals, whereas destiny dictated posterity has reclaimed Acharya Jadunath Sarkar's eminence more than half a century after his death. We can use his own words to illustrate this truth and I quote, in God's universe, no good thing, no honest work is ever lost. The sound seed will bear fruit. It may be a hundred years afterwards. Close quote. And on that profound note, we can conclude the second and final edition of this lecture series on Acharya Jadunath Sarkar and his ascetic majesty of Indian history. But to tell you all the truth, there is so much more to say but then one cannot empty an ocean no matter how deep uh, you dive. This has been both my pleasure and my difficulty. 
and uh, as far as i am concerned this has not been a mere lecture series but it has been a an exalting journey and uh, delving into this great acharya's life it has lit up several dark spots it has uplifted me it has provided me solace and succor and it has taught me the real meaning of strength stoicism and fortitude and uh, i hope all of you have found it useful and uh, any amount of thanks that i offer to the gokhale institute of public affairs will be insufficient and once again my heartfelt gratitude goes out to my good friend shashikiran shri ramu and the entire <clears throat> team at jipa who have organized this and given me this sacred platform and last but not the least definitely not the least my special special thanks are also due to all of you in the audience for giving me such a patient hearing namaste Thank you.